So today we're talking about diving into the Divine Feminine. And the Divine Feminine, if, if you're new to my talks about Masculine and Feminine, the Masculine and Feminine do not stand alone. So when I talk about diving into the Divine Feminine, I don't mean becoming a Divinely Feminine creature. Like that's not it. This is first of all, it's all genders, it's everyone. The feminine and the masculine only exist in relationship to each other. You know, there's no such thing as I am a divinely masculine human, I am a divinely feminine human. These are the two aspects of duality. The masculine and feminine fit together to create oneness. We separate it and look at it differently so that we can learn, right? So that we can kind of it's sort of using our left brain to understand the right brain. It's, it's putting things into pieces so that we can understand the whole. But the point is always to understand the whole, right? It's never about, I only want to be in the feminine because it doesn't work. That's where we've gotten into trouble. This is why um, the world is where it is. It's why we don't understand what the feminine and masculine are because We've tried to make them separate and disconnected. So the entire context of our talk today is understanding the divine feminine, but always hold, and we're going to focus on the divine feminine, but always understanding that it works, it only exists in the marriage of the masculine and feminine. And obviously, you know, I'm not talking about gender. I'm talking about two energies within all of us. Unfortunately, masculine and feminine are the words we use. Yin and yang is similar, but it's not quite as dynamic. There's, a, there's, a, there's an energy about masculine and feminine. So for example, um, this is in my book, Tantric Intimacy, which I know a lot of you guys have. There's a chart for example. And this chart is many of the masculine feminine dynamics that we're going to talk about today. Right? But these exist only with each other. Right? They don't exist separately. You can't you can't receive if there's no giver. Right? You're not resting unless you've been active. They only exist in the contrast of the other it's not a it's not one or the other right and if you try to if you're if you imagine that yin yang symbol right actually i wonder if hang on. if it becomes out of balance like we often will have both but they'll become out of balance so for example many of our yin yang symbol might look like that right where we give too much and we don't receive enough or we do too much but we don't rest enough or we are too orderly and we don't allow enough chaos right they may both exist but they're out of balance and they really need to come into balance so today's talk is all about um, diving into the feminine really really understanding what the healthy beautiful feminine is within within every single one of us and then on my next talk we're going to dive into the masculine our talk on thursday and understand what that is because the problem is they are designed to work together that that is the whole the whole of who we are is us in perfect balance between the masculine and feminine energies not gendered the energies right it's sort of if you imagine the energy of giving and the energy of receiving, they're not the same at all, right? They're completely different. One isn't, it's not a gender, it's just, what are we gonna call it, right? <clears throat> so I also want to talk about the world that we're living in right now, because this is really important 
to understand why we don't understand the feminine, right? Just some context. There's a lot of stories about how this may have happened and whether it was the transition from Lemuria to Atlantis or who knows how this happened or in various religious understandings. But somewhere along the line, the masculine and feminine got disconnected. So imagine there's like a split inside of the human between two aspects of ourselves. And then the desire for maybe power, the desire for control, fear said, well, the answer is doing. The answer is all the things like on that chart that were the masculine, logic, doing, creation, all these things. It's like, you know what? In order to, I don't know, dominate the world, feel strong, control that which we're afraid of, Maybe it was just simply being people being afraid of thunder and lightning. They said, okay, you know what? We're just, we got to take control of the situation. I don't know. There's a million, a million theories as to why this happened. It's not really relevant. We just simply have to sort it out now. But for whatever reason, the masculine and feminine became separated. And the only energy that seemed to give the most power was the masculine in all of us, right? Why do we prize accomplishment over introspection, right? We prize that which can be seen over that which can't be seen. We prize being the giver than being the receiver, right? We shame those that must always receive and we prize those who are so giving, <laughs> right? <laughs> We prize the provider over those who are vulnerable. Like this has become this thing because this is the only thing that seemed to be important. And because they were disconnected, the masculine rose, not man. I mean, that is how it turned out. But the patriarchy, this masculine energy rose and the feminine got pressed down, right? It played out in gender. It played out in... The oppression of different cultures within cultures all over the world right this energy simply played out and so of course the the real challenge with that is is once this happens the more that it's it's like anything the more you disconnect the more you disconnect the less understanding you have of each other the less understanding the feminine has of healthy masculine, because all it's ever felt is this, and the complete misunderstanding of the value of the feminine, because it seems to not contribute anything, right? It's kind of like teaching giving and receiving and lovemaking. And the first question is, well, if the feminine just receives, like they're just gonna lie there and do nothing, <laughs> right? because it's completely misunderstood because there's been too much distance, right? So the goal here is first to even understand what the healthy feminine is, why it all happened, why we are where we are right now. I don't know. <laughs> we could speculate about that and, you know, probably argue about it for a long time. But the bottom line is this is where we are. So we just dive into it. But what's really important is to really even understand within ourselves, right? We can talk about this on a grander scale and almost see our own psyches playing out on the world, on the world screen, right? But how often do each of us also value the masculine within us? And I mean, do we do too much? Do we do as much as we rest? Right? Like you even imagine that for a moment. Like even if we were to be really calculating about this, if there's 24 hours in the day, and let's say if we're lucky, we spend eight hours of those sleeping. Half of 24 is 12. Do we spend four of our waking hours truly resting? 
you know, I mean, 12 hours working is a lot too, but I, I mean doing. If the masculine and feminine, 12 hours doing, creating this gardening, walking, working out, making dinner, da 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 da, da you know, doing all the things, 12 hours of doing in the masculine, in the world, do we spend 12 hours being, resting? Do we value the 12 hours that balance this? Right? What's really interesting is that picture that I was showing you, the, the reason it's in the book is because nature always returns to homeostasis, whether we like it or not. And so what happens is, let's say we start out as a strong yin-yang symbol. <laughs> it's funny, I'm not going to find it now, where it just came. Oh, there it is. We start out as sort of a, a beautiful yin-yang symbol. And when the masculine energy, if we do too much, it consumes the yin, right? The yang consumes the yin, which is why they have to be balanced, right? So what happens is, imagine this picture, right? Imagine this one was once perfectly balanced, balanced yin and yang, balanced masculine and feminine. See how the, the yang has taken over the yin? Now look at how big the yin is. Look how big the feminine is. We will return to homeostasis by becoming smaller right? We will take that yin that we've remained, and in order to stay in balance, we must become smaller. We must contract as a human being. That is why we continually do this until eventually, because then what happens? We get smaller, and we can't do as much, so we drink more coffee, and we take, I don't know, drink Red Bull or something, or we do something to get more energy, more energy, right? more energy, and we just keep contracting because the human body must be in balance right it's not a this isn't an option <laughs> right and it can go the other way too right what if our yin starts to encroach on our yang what if our feminine takes over and we don't honor the masculine right nothing happens our life becomes stagnant our life becomes wild and crazy and out of control right it's always about balance, right? So everything we're going to talk about today, as deep as we go into the feminine, we must know that the goal is to find the beautiful balance of both. And this can be within, it can be in relationships, it's with us, with the world, it's in all places where we experience duality which is basically most of our experience here on the earth. <laughs> so for example, we're just going to go through some of these aspects of the divine feminine within each of us. One beautiful balance is the balance of structure and chaos, or order and chaos. So we can see in the world how structure and order is lauded, right? It's, it's really appreciated. And chaos even the word chaos makes us think of destruction and I was supposed to say, say chaos, but fear and unknown and all this, like hear that, like unknown mystery, who knows what's going to happen next, right? And it's an interesting question to ask ourselves, how comfortable are we with mystery and chaos? Let's actually, I'll put mystery to the side for now. That's another aspect. But chaos, are we comfortable with those times when everything's upside down? When we don't understand what's going on, the structure is disappearing. Are we comfortable with that? You know, it's a really important question. Because if we want to dive into our divine feminine, you know, like I've often told you guys, like I'm not really good at hiding when I'm... Uh, happy or sad. And there are a lot of days I wake up in the morning and I'm just like, oh, you know, like what is going on in the world, right? What's going on in my own consciousness? What's going on in the world? What's, I don't know, rising out of my own 
unconscious, my past lives, my karmic, who knows, right? But whatever it is, there feels like a whirlwind flying around me for some reason. Am I comfortable with that whirlwind? Or am I going to do something to make sure it stops, right? Because that's what we do. That's what we do to the feminine. Oh my gosh, I'm feeling chaotic. Stop it. We have to stop it. It's like, what if you didn't stop it? Like if we're going to honor the, div- honor the divine feminine, then we don't stop it. We maybe create a safe place for it to exist, but we don't stop it. And allow, imagine we say, all right, things are chaotic right now within me, around me. Instead of stopping it, what if we swim in it, right? What if we just allow it? What if we walk around observing what's going on? I remember back in 2011, in this town, in Godridge, there was a tornado. And my daughter and I, it was like a Sunday afternoon, and we were just like hanging out. And all of a sudden, the wind picked up, and you know, the rain started, and, and we love storms, right? So we went over to the window, and we're standing, looking out the window. It's like, oh, it's amazing, right? An amazing storm. It's going to be a good one, right? Feeling the power of Mother Nature, right? Mm. And then all of a sudden, the trees just started bending, like right down to the ground. And we're both, you know that moment where you're going, um, wait a minute. <laughs> Something, something's, um... What's going on? And then all of a sudden, a 30-foot spruce tree flew by the window. And <laughs> you know, our brain kind of does a blip, and it says, wait a minute, what causes trees to fly by your window? And we both went, <gasps> and we went flying down into the basement as this insanity went on above ground. And then all of a sudden, all was quiet. And we had no idea what happened. So we kind of come crawling out of the basement and we literally crawled out and the entire community was flattened. Like everything was down. Like it was just, the houses were just picked up and dropped and our house was damaged, but it stayed stood, stood, stand, stayed standing. And it was really something like, so then of course we kind of grabbed our dog and we just wandered around the town. Right? Of course, I walked over to my train station to make sure it was okay because that was my, my business for anyone who's new. And, but we just wandered around. Like, kind of in a state of awe, really. Like, what happened? Like, this isn't a tornado belt. This isn't something, you know, would ever have happened here. It was at, and it came out of nowhere. It wasn't, no one had any idea it was coming. But there, but there was, that's an, it's an interesting feeling to just sort of walk through observing what's happening, right? Stepping over the downed hydro wires and the, the, the trees and everything else. There's actually a great video that was made of the whole experience. Not the whole experience, but it's a really cool video. If I remember, I'll post it in the circle of the, of the whole town before, during, and after. It was really cool. And, uh, but imagine in your own life today, imagine you wake up in the morning, because this happens to, I'm sure it happens to lots of us here, right? Especially considering the chaos that's happening in the world, right? Imagine you wake up and you imagine your mind like, you know, my daughter and I wandering around the town, observing what's happening and not, not considering it as damage or all that none of that it's just something new something different a change has happened things will never be the same like something is wild and chaotic here imagine you wake up in the morning and you're offside you're feeling uncentered and instead of trying to stop the thing you know instead of trying to do whatever it is we do to quell that chaos. We just wander through it instead. And again, this is the strength of the masculine also, right? That we have this centeredness inside of us that says, all right, let's go check this out. 
even if it's really upsetting, even if it really triggers you emotionally, even if it's whatever, but we don't stop it. When we try to stop it, first of all, it doesn't work. You can't deny the feminine. You cannot deny what is happening, right? That's where we go crazy. That's where we... Yesterday in our talk about the Radiant Sutras, there was a quote about, we were talking about fire and how life was about fire and how fire burns out all that is not real. And there was a quote in there that said, the only difference between heaven and hell is that in hell, they resist the flames, right? And it's like change is life, right? All things about life is change. So every so often, it's like if you go into a forest, everything in the forest is alive. And so it's changing every day. Everything is change. And sometimes we get so addicted to trying to believe that we can stop change. We fear chaos because that's where all change comes out of real change, like real soul change. You know, yesterday I was all sideways, if for any of you guys were who were here, and just, you know, freaked out about weird things going on in my world. But I've really learned to not push it away. You know, whatever it is, I'm staying in it. I'm diving into it. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna stay as crazy as I feel. <laughs> and it was funny, my daughter came over after class yesterday. And so she heard all about it. And, and I was just kind of and so I just sort of dove into it. And, and I was crying and I was all upset about all these things. And but it was kind of one of those things that is like, I, I know that I, the only way through is through. Right. And then, you know, so then we started doing a jigsaw puzzle because I like doing jigsaw puzzles. And then a friend of mine called, and for whatever reason, I put her on speakerphone with me and my daughter. And she's like, how are you doing? And I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> There's all this weird stuff happening. And, uh, but then whatever happened in her conversation and between her and my daughter and me, and we just sort of didn't, and all of a sudden she got off the phone and I went to pour a glass of water and my whole body exhaled. You know that feeling when all of a sudden it's like, <sighs> it's past. Whatever that was is past now. And that's the beauty of the feminine. That's the beauty of the chaos. If we can allow ourselves to experience it, even if it's emotionally raw or whatever it is, it, it's like it colors in who we are it feeds us it nourishes us it it becomes it becomes the foundation it, it just informs the masculine right if you imagine the masculine like the structure or the coloring book the lines the feminine colors it in right that's the life and then you come out the other end and now I'm different Right? I have a whole different sense of peace now. A whole, uh, there's no trigger there anymore. Whatever it was is not there, right? So a similar cousin to this one is the idea of mystery, right? Because often the masculine feminine is considered sort of the light and the dark, but not in a, in a, in a, in a bad way, but in a, the seen and the unseen, or the known and the unknown. How comfortable are we with the unknown? How comfortable are we with the things we cannot explain? The mystery of the universe, the mystery of the world, the mystery even of why we were put here on the planet individually, why each one of us is here. Right? If someone was to say to you, like, what do you really think your mission here is in life or something? The truth is, <clears throat> in a perfect yin-yang answer of that question, 
we would say, well, there's these parts of myself I understand. I believe they are part of why I'm here. But I also understand there's a whole aspect of me I have yet to uncover. This is a very balanced, beautiful statement of being, like to always hold ourselves in a place of learning, in a place of perpetual growth into the mystery of that which we don't know. So if we want to dive into the feminine, the divine feminine within each of us, we dive into that mystery, right? And we really have to ask ourselves, how comfortable am I with even the mystery within myself? And then you imagine how this extrapolates into relationships. Now you're with this other person. What if there's always mystery in them? In the same way that I dive deep into my own mystery and relish it, and I'm excited about the mystery within me, I know this is the juicy stuff. This is the place of expansion. What if every single person we come in contact with, whether we are intimate with them, whether they're part of our inner circle, or whether they're just a stranger walking down the street, what if every single person we look at, we go, well, there's what I can see, and then there's a great mystery to you as well. How exciting does life become? How exciting does every relationship that we have in our life become? It's almost like every single other that is in our life is an opportunity to plumb mystery, to to hear something we've never heard before, right? And this is the, the absolute beauty of, 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 of just loving that, right? Because it's like, uh, sorry, I had a train of thought and it went off. That's the problem when, you know, when we actually, one of the things that in Tantra we'll talk about is treating each other like really seeing the divine within the other and when you can see the divine within each other we, we drop certain fears and guards and we open ourselves to this other in this world where we've only honored the masculine energy of communication we've only honored the the, the talking the teaching the this right I want to be, this is, the, this is the point of power. If I can control the conversation, I'm comfortable, right? So it's, it's always oppressing, not just this other person, but the chance to learn, the chance to actually experience something you've never experienced, right? And that's a huge challenge. But once we kind of see it, and imagine the next person you talk to today you actually go, what do you know that I don't know? What mystery is woven within you that I've never heard before? Maybe you've never heard before. And then we kind of ask ourselves, what question could I ask? Not to be probing or weird, but just to actually have a real communication, real communion with this other person. What if you do have a question and you ask that question and you learn something we've never heard before. Like this is where life becomes interesting. You know? It's like going for a walk. And let's say you say, again, if we have this oppression idea, I'm going to go for a walk because I have to walk 5K every day. And this is important for my overall health. <laughs> Whatever, right? What if we go for a walk and it's a beautiful balance? We have this beautiful structure that says, it would be a lovely structure to go for a 5k walk every day and on the balance I have no idea what I will experience during this 5k walk today what will I see that I've never seen before right what is the balance what is the other half half of that structure what will I experience about myself right and this is again even in sports and fitness our sports and fitness, weight loss, all these things are so oppressed, right? 
we don't listen to the body, right? I used to teach barefoot running. I, uh, I'm a very, um, I'm a very big boned, heavy person, right? Even as a, um, I could always win the, uh, things that when I would go to the exhibitions and stuff and they would have the, guess your weight. You know, if the guy would guess my weight, I'd be like 20 pounds heavier than that because I literally weigh like lead. My kids weigh like lead. We're all like, ugh, right? So running to me is literally how do I destroy my knees and back in five fell swoops, right? <laughs> well, at some point along the line, I got coerced, convinced to run a marathon, which is just insane for my body type. I mean, I could swim a marathon, but running a marathon is not a good idea for me. Long story short, a, a serendipity, a man walks into my train station one day and I'm chewing about how in the world I'm ever going to run this marathon. Ironically, because I heard that in our world tour, part of it was going to be spent at Disneyland <laughs> in Florida. <laughs> the the uh, marathon that I was coerced into was the Disney marathon because you eat cookies every kilometer or so, right? And you take pictures with Mickey and you dance and stuff, which is the kind of, if I'm going to do a marathon, that's it, right? And uh, anyway, I discovered natural running and barefoot running. And the beautiful thing about running barefoot is you must listen to your body because barefoot running you, mu you cannot push yourself. You can't skid your feet. You have to stay present with every single step or else you're going to hurt your feet. You're going to create callus. You're going to do all these things. And I could talk about barefoot running for a long time. Like it's so epically amazing. But what's amazing about barefoot running and why a lot of, um, we would teach barefoot running clinics here. And uh, I also, there's a video actually about me and my friend promoting this barefoot running. Very fun. I can show it to you too. And uh, but a lot of people don't like using barefoot running because they can't push themselves. They can't, I'm going to, I run 5k every day regardless or 10k every day regardless of how I feel. This is a, a mentality that's sort of been in our society. You are going to do this no matter what as opposed to listening to the body. And what if the body says, I need to heal today. I'm still injured from yesterday. Or I'm still recovering from our last run. Or we didn't get enough sleep last night. I don't have enough reserve to run with proper, struct uh, with proper posture. And this is how we injure ourselves in all aspects of our life because we're not listening to the feminine we're not the body is feminine so another aspect is matter and energy or the physical body and the thoughts or what however you want to understand that the divine feminine is this incarnation it is the creation of god it is what if you're an artist the artist is the masculine the art is the created we are the created right? We are the manifest that is the feminine. To ignore what is manifest, to ignore this body, is to destroy this body, right? We must listen to her. <laughs> She's part of it. So my journey, and I'm not saying people should or shouldn't run or whatever, Braveheart running is perfect for me because my body isn't light enough to run like a gazelle, right? If you have that beautiful runner body, runner's body, that you are light, you're, it's like your bones are um, perfectly designed for it, right? Mine are filled with lead. I must listen to her. <laughs> so what's fascinating is when I go running, I must be in constant communion with her. My masculine understands the structure of what I'm doing, but I must be in constant communion with her listening with every step, constantly listening. This is listening to the Divine Feminine. And this is in every aspect of our life or any sport you do or anything. It's like you imagine if you work with animals. Let's say you are an equestrian, you're into horses. One of the most amazing things about people who love horses 
is they know about listening to the feminine. Because <laughs> they are riding an incredible being of 2,000 pounds. And if they aren't listening, they are going to land on their head. <laughs> right? So it's a beautiful thing within us to just simply listen. And this is new in society because this is, this is what we've been taught. Create the system. Ignore the body. Ignore the pain. Ignore your emotions. Ignore, right? The journey to the divine feminine is just honoring what is. Honoring exactly where you are, right? going to speak to another aspect and then I'm going to look at your questions. The idea of rest, there's a, the, sort of the, the activity and rest, is also similar to the idea of expansion and contraction. We often don't like the contraction part of this. Right? We, it's like we want to keep expanding and expanding and expanding and expanding. But at some point, the beautiful part of contraction is it's like we expand into a million ideas. Like, let's say, I mean, I'm sure everybody here is like me. Like, I love learning. I love expanding. I love considering new ideas. But then the universe will sort of throw me a curveball if I don't take time to contract. If I don't take time to allow this consolidation of what really sticks, of what really is me, then I can then expand again. Even the earth, right? Have you ever studied like the sacred geometry of the earth, like the duodecahedrons and the Akasi, and like all these things like the, the beautiful geometry of the earth. And when you actually look at it, it's constantly breathing, right? The earth is always expanding and contracting like this, like our brain, right? Our, on our brain, the plates of our skull are always gently expanding and contracting. That's where people who practice craniosacral work are so valuable because if anything happens and it gets wedged and it can no longer expand and contract, a million things go wrong. Con expansion and contraction is so valuable, right? But we push back on the contraction. We want to be in a state of expansion. We want to be in a state of light. And you know that's what we want. We need to value those times where we become so contracted and navel gazing. And, and it's all good. Like it's important, right? It's really juicy and interesting, right? I always feel like I have to keep going and earning money and never stop working. I feel guilty if I rest. Would absolutely love to embrace my feminine energy more. You know what's really interesting about that is that so I was a I was a computer programmer living in Toronto. I fall in love with a farmer many, many, many years ago in well, it was probably nineteen ninety. And I move to the farm. I get married and I move to the farm. And I really understood so much about our inner wiring. Like, so for example, if we were haying, right? If you, you cut the grass, you bale the grass, you have to bring it into the barn because this is the feed for the winter, right? This is that make hay while the sun shines. You work, it does not matter if you're in pain, it doesn't matter if you're having a bad day, this time must happen. You have to get the hay in. And I watched this, right? I watched this requirement, but it was a very functional requirement. In this moment, you must deny whatever you're feeling because tomorrow it will rain because the wild thing about haying is the only time, especially in Canada, the only time you can get the hay in is right before a storm. Because that is when the, the, the pressure in the air is hot enough to actually dry the hay enough to make it safe to get put away. So the whole time you're haying, it is so 
stinking hot. You're just like, it is literally, I had heat strokes so many times from haying, but it's because there is a storm coming. It's the only time the hay dries <laughs> in Canada. There may be other parts of the world where it's better, but here, and it was fascinating to watch the requirement of denying how you felt because you had to get the hay in. But the thing about farming is it allows the natural expansion and contraction of the seasons. Because when haying's done, you sleep for a week. You tend to whatever has to happen, right? Haying ends, it's a season, right? And this is what we've lost touch with, that we can work like crazy, but then we must rest or we will burn out. Like it's a, anyway, it was really, really valuable for me to see somewhere where some of this came from, where this sort of not listening to our inner truth came from, right? I'm going to use this with parenting, allowing a safe place for my 13 year old to embrace his chaos because I'm finding myself stifling it. It's so valuable. Like when my children were young, you know, to, and it was a huge lesson for me to even allow myself to have chaos. Um, I remember like, you know, they were just normal kids and they would have a complete fit because of, of something, right? And, and uh, <laughs> one of my favorite stories about my daughter, my daughter is this fiery redhead, right? She's very peaceful and calm now. Like she is like literally my great counsel. But as a child, I mean, she was just this fiery redhead. I mean, if you thwarted her, you were going to pay. Like, just pay. And one time, she was me. I don't even know if she was two years old. But she was, she was young enough that she was in the tub. And I couldn't leave her there, right? I couldn't leave her alone. I had to be by the tub because she would drown or whatever, right? So she was that small. Anyway, so I brought all the laundry into the bathroom. I'd done everything I possibly could. And, you know, she'd been in there for an hour. And I was like, okay, honey, you got to get out of the tub now. No, I don't want to get out of the tub. I know, sweetie, but you got to get out of the tub because mommy's got to go on and kind of keep doing stuff, right? I don't want to get out of the tub. <laughs> so I was like, well, okay, you still have to get out of the tub. So I drained the tub and she's mad as mad, right? And I'm like... <laughs> There's nothing I can do, honey. You know? So I picked her up and I put her outside the tub and she's standing there and she's mad as blazes. Like just like she's just this little tiny naked girl with fiery red hair and freckles and just like, ah, like this, right? Well, so beyond the, the bathroom, there was like a, like imagine if, if you guys are, are where she is and I'm on a couch right over there. So I didn't want to leave her. So I just sort of sat there on the couch while she screamed. Like, you know Charlie Brown screaming where the mouth is this big and all you see is a little tongue? That was her. She just stood there with her little little fists and screamed bloody murder. And then she crossed her arms and she just, like, total scream. Anyway, I'm sitting on the couch with the cat. And the cat's looking at me like, what the hell is this, right? So the cat, I don't know what this sounds like to a cat, but it must have been pretty deafening. So our cat walks across the room, looks at Taylor, looks at me, walks back, kind of like to say, are you going to stop this? And I'm like, right. <laughs> so the cat walks across the living room into the bathroom, puts its little paws on her little arms like this and bitter. <laughs> and my daughter stops and she's like <gasps> like this you know and then the cat just looks at her and she looks at me and Taylor starts screaming again <clears throat> the cat literally walks up to me looks at me like I've done all I can and left and went into the kitchen <laughs> and, <laughs> anyway it is something to allow our children to experience whatever they're experiencing, and especially as teenagers. Even as teenagers, honestly, my kids are in their 20s now, there was something about really being honest, because sometimes I think my teens, 
the frustration they felt with the world and life and others and it was exactly how I also felt in truth but my adult side had was just stifling it and so for me like the easiest thing like when my kids were teens was just to kind of say yeah I totally get it <laughs> a little frustrated myself you know <laughs> my cat's so funny where do emotions sit in masculine and feminine? The emotions sit in the feminine because the emotions are our truth. They are the true response of this manifested being to our reality around us. So when we oppress our emotions, we are oppressing the feminine. When we listen to our emotions, we're listening to truth, right? We're listening to our actual, our actual reality. I am angry, I am frustrated, I am sad, I am thrilled, I am, you know, this is, this is truth. So important. If you imagine this is the truth, this is the reality, the masculine then maybe takes action based on that reality, but the feminine is the reality in every single one of us, right? That's why Feminine is also considered, often considered the wise wisdom within that deep taproot of wisdom. Because when you actually are allowed to own your emotions, you, you just, they're just what it is. So does that feminine emotions give any balance of masculine required? Totally, because the masculine is the stillness and the strength within. Like for me to actually be able to dive into my emotions I need to know that I also am my own lifeline, right? I know that if I fly into, even even anger, right? People, people when I talk and, or teach about having 100% kindness in the world, right? People will often say, but what if I'm in a bad mood? Well, the feminine is I honor the fact that I'm angry right now. My masculine structure says, but I'm not going to, make you pay for it. I'm not going to be angry at you. You, I'm not going to rage on you. I'm not going to control you. This is my structure for my emotions. I get to feel this within my truth, within my quiet, right? We have to have that beautiful structure within to be able to have this chaos, right? It's almost the, uh, the hurricane, the eye of the hurricane, right? right? As long as we can be in the center, it can rage on all at once because this is us, right? Raising a teenager is so interesting. One day they want to talk, but the next day they hit us. <laughs> One of the things I realized with my children was, I've told a lot of you guys this story, but when, when I, they were young, I realized, because I was always trying to have that, I was trying to present again that masculine stoic structure right and and the world wants to pretend it's just this masculine stoic controlled structure but it's not true the world is is nature the world is chaos the world is wild the world is wonderful and full of mystery right and growth and change that's the real world but the structure of the world the structure of the governments or whatever, the churches have said, no, this is the box. Everyone's going to fit in the box, period, end of story, right? What happens to all that chaotic energy? And then what happens is if as parents, we then reinforce this, we must do this, who is going to, where is that energy going to go? In my experience, it goes into my children. When my kids were little, the more I was trying to maintain a false stoic front, the more they fought about who touched who. They, they didn't fight about important things. They fought about nonsense. It was almost just like, because I was oppressing the truth, I was oppressing my own feminine, I was oppressing my actual reality, my own emotions, that energy just got sent out like, like free radicals into the field and my kids just picked them up and threw them at each other 
Well, is that what's happening with our teenagers? Right here they are in this incredibly difficult time of um, hormonal changes and shifts. I mean, if anyone here has ever gone through a hormonal shift, either pregnant or frustrated or menstrual or whatever, I mean, I mean, obviously that's all just women, but if you've ever had anything that's thrown your hormones off, you kind of lose control of yourself in some way. Well, if there are kind of emotional free radicals flying around the world because we're trying to impose this false masculine structure on a reality that's designed to be in beautiful homeostatic balance, guess who's going to go flying sideways? Our kids, our teenagers. So there's something really interesting about really being thankful when our teenagers are going sideways, right? To kind of go, what is this showing me, right? And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about the, the daughter who went non-binary or the previous daughter. I'm talking about the previous question because the, it's a really, like our kids are going to, and not just necessarily yours, but even societies or the schools or whatever. So it's a fascinating thing to really listen to them. And don't believe we have the answers. To embrace them in all the mystery they are. To embrace them in all the karma they may have come in with. In all the ancestral DNA coming from us into them. You know, it's kind of, it's shocking sometimes to look at my children and go, whew, that mirror is really close, <laughs> right? What about things I don't know how to navigate with my kids? I have a former daughter that has come out non-binary. I don't know how to navigate this. And I thought I was very open-minded. The interesting thing about, you know, for the question around your, your, um, child that came out non-binary these are all beautiful things right the, the whole exploration of being allowed to be whoever we are right that gender is not important where we were born wasn't important what color our skin is isn't important none of this is important none of it defines us whether i identify as female male both neither whether I love to make love with women or men or everyone, whether I'm polyamorous, monogamous, all these things, it has nothing to do with my soul. It has nothing to do with loving me. It has nothing to do with connecting with me. These are just aspects of my being. And I think this is what's really being challenged right now. You know, that we're really being asked to see the soul within each person and none of the labels matter right to be able to say to someone who truly has been wrestling with gender identification their whole life or wrestling with anything in their life and be able to say to them i just think you are awesome <laughs> you the soul you the being you know I just think you're amazing and I want to support you in whatever allows your soul to expand. Right? It's, it's lovely. Again, they are honoring their feminine. They are honoring their truth. How awesome is that? It's a whole new world. You know? It's, uh, it's different and it's new. And... Um, and again, you know, it's funny, this oppression of the, of the mystery in life, the unknown. I think a lot of that has happened with, um, with people who um, identify as non-binary or trans or all this kind of thing, right? It's just, it's just unknown, it's just, it's like we're so accustomed to wanting to slot people into boxes that make us feel comfortable because we've been taught that the structure makes us feel comfortable. What if the structure doesn't make us feel comfortable? What if it's the beautiful balance of both and getting to meet someone? 
I have lots of friends who are non-binary and both and whatever. And it's like awesome, right? <laughs> and, and it doesn't change our relationship and it doesn't even change our conversations. So, and, and it also often gives great insight into, uh, I don't know, into just the true, what it truly is to be human. Thank you. Any advice for someone who is feeling stuck in a period of contraction and low energy? I struggle to embrace it as it feels I've gone backwards from a place of life, zest, and productivity to a place of blah. My experience of being stuck in a place of contraction normally happens when... Um, There's something I, I don't want to look at. Like Carolyn Mace used to teach that we often end up in a dark night of the soul because we've, we've prayed for an answer or we've seen what our next step is, but we don't like it. And, um, and we're waiting for a second option. One of the challenges in life is that when we're asking for truth and when we're asking to listen within and we get an answer, there's only one answer. It's the answer that's right for our soul in this moment. And so often we get stuck in contraction and we can't go back to expansion because there's some door that we have to open. And for some reason, it's too scary and uh, so that's the question I would ask if I felt like I was in a long a contracted time of contraction I would ask myself what is it I don't want to be true that's the question I would ask myself Steve if we can find order within the chaos can we find the feminine within the masculine Mm -hmm. I think it's like literally looking at it like um, uh, um, a positive, no, yeah, the negative of a photograph and the positive of a photograph, right? If you see the, the whirlwind of a hurricane, right, and imagine this is the chaos, and we find our beautiful masculine center in the eye of the hurricane, right? That's finding the peace in the chaos to find the feminine and the masculine is the reality is we do have a beautiful structure the feminine is what we color in in the lines right or around the lines it's the color in the structure it's it's having like let's say in a workplace if you have a really strong leader right strong this is reminding me of a talk I want to do so I'm going to do a talk about strong leadership thank you for reminding me <laughs> If you have a strong leader, a good leader, not a boss that's doing this, but a strong leader that has a great vision, they will create a perfect structure for healthy brainstorming, expansion of everyone that's there, you know, really digging deep into fantastic creativity, right? And within that amazing creativity will happen within this beautiful, strong structure, right? But you have to it's, again, you have to look at it completely differently, like the negative of a picture and the positive of a picture, right? I just realized that trying to help my elderly parents, particularly my dad, is a bit like raising a teenager. He can't control his emotions and outbursts. So difficult, Cindy. I sometimes wonder, you know, if these are the times that, again, if we ask ourselves, like, um, you know, we ask ourselves, why is this happening? You know, why is it so difficult? And when we come back to um, asking ourselves, okay, why is this? Um, how, how is this helping me? You know, there's something wild about being around people who 
are out of control, it really throws us into our center. Like it really throws us into our deep taproot. You know, like I find myself, if I'm around people who are out of control, I have to breathe deeper, right? I have to find my center, which is quite a blessing, right? It's a blessing any, every time I have to go deeper into who I am. It's the same like one of the bigger things that happened to me yesterday in, in my struggle and then my final uh, release was whatever was said in all the conversations, I finally saw the bigger picture again. Like I was forced into that bigger picture. Like I, I did the detail-y stuff and then something happened and I went, oh, right? And now I'm thankful because it was almost going all the way in, catapulted me into a bigger picture. So I'm thankful. What was your bigger picture revelation? Um, was that there are great things happening behind the scenes that I don't understand. And I have great faith in that. And it's something I've known right from the beginning. And uh, just every so often I get lost in the weeds. The wild thing when my kids were little was again, you know, how do you embrace the feminine, right? Um, it was, it's so, it's so much simpler than we think. Like for me, it was about a lot. So for example, one of the other aspects about the feminine we didn't talk about today, because as you can imagine, I can talk about this for many, many, many hours, is vulnerability, right? And to allow myself to be vulnerable around my children, even when they were little. And again, vulnerability isn't a weakness. Right? That's the problem, is all of these things that I've named as the feminine are considered a weakness or a bad thing or a thing we want to push away or the thing we want to get through or a thing we want to end. Vulnerability is just a time of difficulty. And so when my kids were little and I got really knocked out, I would just allow myself to be vulnerable. Like I would sit on the couch and I'd be sad and I'd be crying or whatever and and they would be, you know, what's wrong, mommy? I'd say, I don't know. I'm just really tired. I'm just going to close my eyes for a while. Nine times out of ten, they'd tuck in with me. Like there was, there's something, there's something magical about the resonance of truth, right? There's something about they didn't have to fix me. They didn't have to do anything. I mean, sometimes they'd go and say, do you want a cup of tea, mom? You know, and, and I'd see them like toddling into the kitchen thinking that, you know, and I'd be like, oh, <laughs> you know, like, but it always started with me just being honest. Like, just because that's the challenge, right? Is that because we don't understand healthy vulnerability, like maybe we were raised around people who used their emotions to manipulate us. Like I'm so sad and now I'm supposed, the other person's supposed to sit and rub their back and make them tea into this and we were manipulated using this. But to be just really clear that, you know, that's not what I was doing. And I was just really tired or really sad. Or like I used to, when my kids were young, like I suffered with, uh, suffered is the word I with migraines I had brutal migraines like just mind blackening three days of vomiting migraines and my kids just I don't know I you know talk about something that takes you to your knees right and but you just sort of become accustomed to man you better be on you better start being honest with what's going on here and anyway, I kind of taught you to, I don't know, 
I think it's so important to cry. I think it's so important to be honest. I think it's so important to just allow emotions to flow. And we teach our children that, right? Like my kids to this day say that. They say, you know, we're so thankful that um, we were allowed to process emotions and we were allowed to have bad days and we were allowed to cry and we were allowed to be frustrated and, you know. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful day, a lovely evening. And we'll talk to you soon.